Lehman and I were driving down to southern parts. We had many hours to fill and uh, started listening to The Lord of the Rings on audiobook, which I, like, I cannot recommend enough listening to The Lord of the Rings on audiobook as read specifically by Robert Inglis. And I think it, it may be that I am preparing to teach my old English class again next semester, so I'm like in the Anglo-Saxony oral liter alliterative verse mindset. But listening to these books, being and I'm and I'm on it, like I'm almost through the two towers now, and I'm 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 in it. Uh, listening to these books read aloud, you're just like Oh, right. J.R.R. Tolkien knew his stuff. I mean, there's bits of these where I'm like, you could almost, like, I could assign it to students as a analyze Tolkien's prose from an Anglo-Saxon poetic rhythm perspective. Uh, they just, they flow almost magically. And I mean, Tolkien obviously understood the power of language and was steeped in it. Tolkien also understood the power of story. I mean, the whole point of The Lord of the Rings was Tolkien himself trying to write some mythology for England that, that didn't have its own sense of, you know, mythological origin stories, right? Arthur is Welsh and French and, uh, you know, we can have a whole conversation about that. Uh, apparently, I'm just nerding out this morning, so apologies, everyone. Uh, but on that vein, one of the things that I am also prepping for this year is a trip to New Zealand, which I have long, long, long wanted to do. And uh, it will be 0% surprise to any of you that one of the first things that I have done is book my Lord of the Rings filming locations tours, because I have priorities. And I love I love the marketing of these companies, which are, you know, put yourself inside the story of Middle Earth. Go take a photo op as an elf in Lost Lorien. And I'm just like, you, you know your audience. Your audience is me. I am it. I sign up. Um, but there is something about the power of story and narrative and wanting to claim a narrative for ourselves, which certainly is what Tolkien was doing in his writing, about wanting to put ourselves into a large epic story. There is a human drive and desire for that. And it is interesting to think about that sort of human longing and desire, the desire to enter into something epic beyond ourselves in light of today's commemoration, the baptism of Christ, which is in many ways a feast and a commemoration that is about marking God's choice of ultimate solidarity with us and with our human story, almost putting the reversal on that human longing. The God who chose ultimate solidarity and communion with our story and what that, what that means for us and our calling as those who share in Christ's baptism. So if you are perhaps less familiar with the liturgical calendar and how it works, every Sunday following the Feast of the Epiphany, which we associate with the visit of the wise men to the infant Jesus, we commemorate the baptism of Christ. And it is very much a continuation of the story of the Incarnation. The, the Feast of the Epiphany is about the manifestation, the showing forth, the illumination of the meaning of the Incarnation. 
of Christ. And so it is a very, very fitting moment. The baptism of Christ is also in all four of the synoptic gospels very much the inciting point for the story of Jesus's work and ministry. Some of you will have definitely heard me say before, when something shows up in all four gospels, you know it's pretty important. And the baptism of Christ is one of those stories. In fact, in both John and Mark, the baptism of Christ is, is all we get. There is no narrative or no nativity story at all. We just start immediately with the baptism. Something critical is begun in the story of Jesus' baptism that all of the gospel writers want us to note and pay attention to. But there has also always been a question around Jesus' baptism. Why? Why did Jesus have to get baptized? Especially when we are introduced to John the Baptist as proclaiming a baptism of salvation for the repentance of sins. Why was it that Jesus had to be baptized? And there has always been theological commentary and struggle and debate about this very question. And we hear it in the gospel itself. John asking Jesus, why, why are you wanting to be baptized by me? I am the one who should be baptized by you. And I find Jesus' response that we get in Matthew's text interesting. Let it be so for now to fulfill all righteousness. And we don't get a lot of unpacking about exactly what that means, but I do think it is worth noting that it is a positive framing of Christ's baptism, right? There is not something in the baptism of Christ that has to erase or wash away something that is wrong or insufficient or, you know, tainting in Jesus's humanity to his divinity. There is a fulfillment of a marking out, a showing forth of the purpose of Jesus's being and personhood in this act of baptism. I think it is very interesting to see Jesus' baptism as very much that first act of public solidarity with us and with our humanity, with all of those who are gathering from far and wide coming to John themselves for baptism. Jesus' act of stepping into those waters is stepping into the water of our shared humanity. It is a choosing, not of some form of exceptional personhood that Christ embraces in the Incarnation but of a personhood that is shared fully and completely. I mentioned that I had been pretty sick this week, so I hope you will indulge me in sharing a passage from Debbie Thomas, who I have quoted many and many and many times in my sermons. Uh, and I have shared this passage before, but it's one that I think is worth hearing again where she talks about Jesus stepping into our humanity. Unbelievable though it may seem, Jesus' first public act was an act of stepping into his humanity in the fullest, most embodied way. 
Let it be so, he told John, echoing the radical consent of his mother Mary, who raised him in the faith. Let it be so at the hands of another, he decided, as he submitted to John the baptizer. Because what Jesus did, and still does with power, is freely surrender it, share it, give it away. Let it be so here, he said, in the Jordan River, rich with sacred history. The Jordan where once upon a time his forebears, the ancient Israelites, entered the land of Canaan. The Jordan where the prophet Elijah ended his prophetic ministry, and his successor Elisha inaugurated his. The Jordan which flowed under the same open sky God first opened in the beginning, at the very dawn of creation. In other words, in this one moment, in this one act, Jesus stepped into the whole story of God's work on earth and allowed that story to resonate, deepen, and find completion. The question for us on this celebration of the baptism of Christ is always to contemplate in light of Christ's baptism, our own baptismal identity and calling. And the baptism that we share with Christ is the baptism of ultimate solidarity. The solidarity that God freely chose with us and with our human story and the solidarity that we share are called to live into with one another particularly the most vulnerable, the most marginalized, those often cast to the edge of our shared human experience and story. Consider what it means for us to live into that ultimate solidarity particularly as we enter into, again, a new cycle of remembrance of the life of Christ up into his ultimate point of radical solidarity in his death and resurrection. And I cannot conceive of a more epic story than that to participate in. Amen. Thanks be to God.